Well, for the first time in what over 25 years, the MLB has a lockout, and uh, you know it was just on the heels of the Phillies making a couple moves. Here to talk some Philadelphia Phillies baseball and the MLB lockout is Locked On Phillies host Dan Wilson. Dan, how are you doing today? Doing great, Kale. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course, of course. Um, so you know, right before the lockout, there was a crazy amount of activity and spending. Yeah. What do you what do you think about all that? You know, it was a historic run of contracts in, in Major League Baseball right before that lockout. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it was actually pretty fun. It was like how free agency and trades work in like other sports, like NFL, NBA, where free agency opens and it's just a it's a mad rush of contracts. I mean, I was literally going through the deals here the other day. I mean, just the Mets alone get Scherzer, Escobar, Marcana, Starling Marte. Cross baseball, Javier Baez signs uh, with the Tigers. You got Seager going to the Rangers, Marcus Simeon, Kevin Gosman, Robbie Ray, um, to the point where so much money was handed out that Bryce Harper now will be, you know, assuming there is a 2022 baseball season at the, at, you know, at best, he will be the 18th highest paid player next season in terms of average annual valuation. So look, a lot of money was handed out. A lot of money was clearly handed out just before this kind of arbitrary deadline certainly there's still a lot of big name players still out there you know like Chris Bryant Nick Castellanos uh Kyle Schwarber all players who you know are kind of on the Phillies radar here and I'm sure we'll discuss those guys in a little bit uh as well as guys like Trevor Story uh you know still going back to that shortstop class Carlos Correa as well players who you know some of them who are big names clearly wanted to get something done before this impending lockout, some guys now enter this work stoppage and this weird time that no one really knows how long it's going to last, basically without a team entirely unemployed. So I like the fact that we had so much action in baseball leading up to that date, 1159 Eastern on December 1st. I think it made for an exciting baseball offseason. I was glad that the Phillies did something just beforehand, getting Corey Kniebel for a while there. It looked like they were going to do nothing at all. Uh, so at least there's something. They, of course, also lost Hector Neres, who was a reliever in their bullpen, which I was actually you know, kind of upset about to see him go. He wasn't a closer, but certainly one of the better setup guys and better uh, middle relief guys the Phillies had. And he goes to Houston. So there was a lot of action. You're absolutely right. But now all of that takes a back seat because the collective bargaining agreement expires. The owners have elected to lock the players out here, so to speak. and uh, these two sides do not exactly have a history of cooperation as very recently as the, the, you know, the shortened season, the 60 game season in the COVID year in 2020, they, it took them a while for these two, for these two sides to get on the field and say, all right, here's how we're going to prorate everything. Here's how this season's going to work. Here's who gets money. Here's, who's, here's who doesn't. Here's how we're all going to kind of take this hit. And now we, you know, they have a little bit more time. There's a little bit less, uh, you know, logistical nightmare. There's a, certainly a little bit more certainty, of course, if, you know, if this new COVID variant or something pops up and makes things worse, it'll throw a whole other new wrench into it. So there's a lot to take into account here. But if, even if we're assuming, quote unquote, normalcy entering 2022, I, this could go on for months and months. And the Phillies and every other team, for that matter, have zero ability to add anyone to the roster, you know, until that changes. So you mentioned the lockout and what, you know, what might fans do you think see? What, what, what do you think we're in store for here? Obviously, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a lot of guesses at this point. Um, but what do you think that the, the lockout is going to look like to fans over the next however long? Yeah, I mean, I think we probably see a lot of, you know, a few months of stalemate. You know, I, there's a number of things the players want, the owners don't want, vice versa. And, I, I, you know, I was reading up on it. You know, I'm not a, a quote unquote insider on this by any stretch of the imagination. There were, I actually have a lot of questions myself um, in terms of, you know, this is the first lockout, Major League Baseball lockout of my lifetime. We've seen it in the NFL. We've seen it in the NBA. We've seen it in the NHL who missed an entire season, 04, 05, something like that. But in my lifetime, I have not seen a baseball lockout to the point where, you know, the game was threatened in the way that it is right now. Now, the Players Union, obviously very strong. Some call it, you know, the strongest in sports, one of the strongest workers unions in the world, I guess you could say, and look, they're not going to back down anytime soon. I would, every sense I get, every insider you read or every live TV hit you see, um, I get the idea that these two sides are in it for the long haul. They'll probably cruise through December, cruise through January, 
February, maybe a sense of urgency comes back. That's when pitchers and catchers would begin to happen. Players now still not talking to their teams and suddenly everyone's looking around and saying, hey, we should be reporting to Florida or Arizona or, you know, whatever spring training site you have here. And it's not going to happen. Let's try and heighten talks. But I mean, like the two sides met for seven minutes the other day uh, on the final deadline. They had zero intention of getting something done before this deadline. The only reason this deadline is a big deal right now is because they picked December 1st or, you know, is the expiration date and December 2nd is the first day of this new normal that they have. Um, so I would say that the real deadline will be in February, maybe early March. Once games start to get threatened, you'd like to think the sides will reach some middle ground. Uh, once again, everything you read is that the two sides are talking gibberish to each other. The players association is like, well, we want things like free agency earlier and higher, you know, pay scales and stuff like that. And the owners are like, what are you talking about? Like the game is fine. You know, I don't understand why we could change anything. So you'd figure there's some sort of happy medium at that point as of right now. That seems like a long ways away, but it certainly will affect the offseason because, again, as long as they wait, all of these big night game free agents just sit there in limbo because, you know, the <laughs> teams and players aren't allowed to link up until the players as a whole and the owners as a whole decide to link up. So, I mean, it certainly affects a lot. The one thing that I, I've heard repeatedly and I think that everyone can come to agreement on is there, there's probably going to be a universal DH in, in baseball if there's a collective bargaining agreement, assuming one is reached. Um, what are your feelings on that? And what are your feelings on how that's going to impact the Phillies? Yeah, so I have been a long advocate of, and I would say this is not the norm for someone my age. I just recently turned 24. And generally, you know, people my age, it's not just an age thing, but the newer age baseball fan in general definitely seems to like the DH. And it's not that I'm trying to impede progress. Maybe I'm just a baseball purist at heart. I do like National League Baseball, I see, you know, fist pumping here. Um, that's not to say I don't see the advantages of the DH. It's always kind of bothered me that the two leagues had different rules. It never really made a ton of sense to me that we get to the World Series and, you know, some of the games have a DH and some games don't. And I think back to the most infamous case, I think, is 2011 when Nelson Cruz is playing right field. The guy hasn't played the outfield all year. Now in the biggest game of the Rangers season, he's stuck in right. So something doesn't always sit well with me, the fact that, players who like American league players and American league teams that build themselves with the DH all season long, get into the world series. They're playing a game in an NL park. And now suddenly the tables have totally turned. I mean, you know, you could spin it as that's the ultimate home field advantage, but you know, there's no, there's nothing else like that in sports. There's not a, and this isn't, this is apples to oranges. It's not the same thing, but you, you don't, you don't see a, like a four point shot only in the Western conference in the NBA and suddenly in the NBA finals, it matters kind of thing. Right. So like that part never really, I never really loved. I kind of wish the rules, like one thing I will like when this eventually happens and in my perfect world, they would just have pitchers hit, not because I enjoy pitchers hitting, but because I do enjoy the strategy that comes around that I like the double switch. I like the idea of thinking, you know, subbing offense for defense or things like that. Um, but it is not where the game is headed. You know, people want to see more offense. The game could certainly use more offense. I, I'm all for growing the game the designated hitter probably is that you know what if the goal is to grow the game i'm still going to watch you're still going to watch all the purists who prefer national league baseball are still going to watch i've been waiting this for some time now i actually i think i'd have to go back and find the tweet but i think i tweeted early in the pandemic that you know i'd like to think i, yeah, I give myself a little bit of credit here i felt like that was going to be the end of national league baseball as we knew it i'm like all right they're gonna have a shortened season this is the year that makes sense to try all these wacky rules you've ever heard of 60 games, throw in the DH, throw in the, the batter minimums, try all types of replay stuff. And then you figure out what works and what doesn't. And then it didn't make a ton of sense to me to bring back national league baseball in 2021, just with the idea that they were going to revert right back to the 2020 way in 2022 and beyond. So I don't like the idea of kind of switching back and forth again, in my perfect world, National League Baseball is a style of baseball that I like better moving forward, but I also realize it's not realistic and it's not what the majority wants to see and it's not where the game is going. So just commit to it already. And also, if you're going to commit to it for a season, why don't you tell your National League teams that so they can actually start building their teams that way? Uh, from a Phillies perspective, I would actually, you know, that entire take I just had on National League Baseball, not beneficial to the Phillies for a team that is built around anything but defense. Reese Hoskins, Alec Bohm, JT Romuto getting older as well. 
you certainly had a guy like Andrew McCutcheon last year who was a defensive liability by the end. You know, they're in talks to, you know, potentially sign a guy like if you were going to go after a guy like Chris Bryant, right? He becomes your third baseman. Now you're looking at a situation where Bohm, Real Muto, Hoskins, Bryce Harper, is he, I mean, he's in year four of a 13 year contract, but you figured down the line, you'd like to get him some days off his feet. Like there's massive, massive benefits to having a DH from a Phillies perspective. I think they're, they have bats in the lineup that they would prefer to not be sticking in the field. And I think they're built more to have it, but, and let's say they go after a guy like Kyle Schwarber as well. Like that's another guy who stick in the DH. You just rotate a bunch of guys through. So it kind of annoyed me last year that they weren't, they didn't really commit to it either way. They kind of left the possibility of it. There was no DH heading into the season. Right now we obviously have a lock and it's one of the things they'll negotiate. But if you're Dave Dombrowski or, you know, any, any person who runs a national league team, you have to prepare for both possibilities. And again, in any other sport, you would know the rules of that sport before the off season even began. And I guess for all intents and purposes, the off season's on hiatus right now, but we just had an entire, I mean, we, we just had a pretty big signing period and transaction period where national league teams didn't really know the rules. So that's what's kind of annoying to me more than anything else. If you're going to pick a rule, even if it's not a rule that is a favorite of mine, like you have to declare it one way or another. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, of course, you'd mentioned it before, Knable, you know, they were able to sign him, Camargo. Um, but right after, you know, the, the CBA is agreed upon, we expect there to be another transactions rush, I would think. So what do you think about those signings? They were able to get a reliever for $10 million. Uh, Camargo could be a possible backup infielder. And then what do you think is going to happen in the free agent uh, rush when the CBA is agreed upon? Yeah, I mean, I like Camargo as a bench bat. Uh, certainly, he spent some time in the National League East uh, with the Braves. I've seen him, you know, seen him play a bunch. Uh, it kind of, you know, I, I thought it was a good kind of under the radar signing, if you will. Uh, Knievel, glad that they, or Knievel, was glad that they were able to add him just, again, so they could get something. I mean, he kind of fills a little bit of that Hector Neris role. He, the guy's been a closer in the majors before, has a long standing. Like any reliever, you have ups and downs in your career, but has a good chunk of his career where he's had a lot of success. I think the Phillies obviously need a number of guys like that. I don't think that can be it in terms of uh, addressing your bullpen. Certainly there are guys still out there, whether it's the Kenley Jansons um, of the world. Mark Melanson signed just before uh, the signing period. He was out there. Uh, The possibility of a Craig Kimbrell trade still exists, things like that. So, I would still like to see them address this bullpen. Dave Dabrowski heading into the offseason said it's the biggest need. Uh, certainly hard to really disagree with that when you see they blew 31 saves last year. And again, it is a bit of a misleading stat given they didn't lose all those games. Some of those saves were multiple blown saves in the same game. Um, but the, I mean, the bullpen has been an issue for years and years and years here. Uh, so anything that you're doing to address that is huge. And as I mentioned, like I saw a lot of, celebration in the departure of Hector Neris. I was not one of those people. I think the guy probably gets a bad rap because they tried him as a closer many times and he was the longest tenured Philly and has a lot of memory, certainly where he's blowing games for the Phils. But once they moved him out of that closer spot, he actually turned out to be one of the more reliable relievers and arms in the bullpen guy can be a bit of a head case, I suppose, but for the deal that Houston got him on, I forget what the exact, terms or two for 23 something like that it wasn't that much more or that different from per year it was certainly two years instead of one than what they gave uh Knable. and like i would have preferred to have him back as well and again and you, you know you saw how many times last year with joe girardi and i wasn't a huge fan of girardi but had nights where he just can't even he doesn't have any reliable relievers in his bullpen you're by the end of the season you're going to guys like camper drosian for you know high leverage situations it's just ridiculous so they need to address uh, the bullpen certainly more so than they already have. They still could use a left and center fielder. That's where guys like Kyle Schwarber come into play. Maybe Kevin Kiermeyer is another guy I haven't mentioned who comes into play a little bit of defensive center fielder, works into like a seven, eight hitter kind of role. Uh, so those are all moves that are on the radar. Guys who are still out there as possibilities. And, you know, probably we don't hear those names pop up again until let's say February when these maybe these two sides the players association and the owners get together and hash this thing out 
And then we're right back to not square one because some moves have already made, but like you said, it's going to be another transaction rush. It's almost like it feels like uh, college sports in a way. It's like you have a signing period, a break, and then another signing period. So I like it. I think it's interesting. Baseball will certainly be discussed all off season. Uh, it will not be good if baseball starts to miss games and start losing revenue in that sense. But from a staying in the news kind of perspective, um, that I mean that <laughs> we won't be short on baseball headlines really all off season. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And instead of talking signings, let's talk possible trades. Um, there, there are some possible trade options on this roster, um, but, you know, it might also take a little bit of money to move to, you know, there's not some, some big contract numbers um, that these, these guys are carrying. So uh, one guy I'm going to throw out there right away that I've seen floated a few times is Gene Segura. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, I don't think he's off the market. I, look, Gene Segura, good player. I, probably be a tad overrated at times i mean he ended right around the, like he, he was regarded as having like a pretty good season last year and his ops ended right around 800 and that was kind of on the high end of his potential uh, you know he obviously had his clubhouse issues with joe girardi as well i mean i think he certainly fills your spot at second base right now and if you move on from him you have to figure out what it is you're going to do i mean there have been i'll say less realistic possibilities where you move on from a guy like segura you trade for Craig Kimbrell and then Bryson Stott ends up as your second baseman. And if you could do that and sign a guy like Trevor Story, let's say now you have, you know, your shortstop, your second baseman, your closer, and you move on from Segura. So I don't think Segura is off the table. Again, he, he's good. I don't dislike Segura, though. He sometimes, I mean, he's a, he's a contact guy that, you know, can drive you a little bit nuts when he's swinging at pitches outside the zone and stuff like that. And I don't think he's, like, I don't think Gene Segura profiles as, like, a, I know he's been an all-star, but as a consistent all-star, if that makes sense. I think he's a good player. I don't think he's a great player. Um, and, again, I think he, the way we in which we talk about him is just tends to be a little tad inflated. But, again, so I think if you were going to move, I, one rumor that specifically has been thrown out there is the idea of trading him for someone like Kimbrell, uh, for, you know, a closer who's been in baseball, feels like, forever. It's like, okay, well, if you do that, it's a very short-sighted move. Like, who is your second baseman? You know, it seems like Bryson Stott's going to come up and be your shortstop, if not from opening day at the jump, very, very soon. But with your second baseman at that point, so there almost has to be like a corresponding plan to go with that, if that makes sense. I'm comfortable with Gene Segura being the opening day second baseman, but I, I, he's not hes not off the table if someone calls about Gene Segura. And he's certainly not off the table if I thought that was going to you know, get a deal done that would improve this team. Let's go with your scenario that the Phillies are, you know, they're going to bring up Bryson Stott. He's going to be opening day, second baseman. They're able to make a move, get another shortstop. You think they're able to convince another team to take Didi Gregorius's contract with some, some cash thrown in there? Um, yeah. D Didi Gregorius, not great. Um, he, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's on the second year of a contract. Um, if the team, yeah, I don't know who you're going to get to take that contract, to be perfectly honest. I mean, the, the upside on taking on DD is just very, very low, unfortunately. Um, I never really thought it made sense. I, I think I might have said this the first time uh, that I ever did an interview with you. The move always was giving him a qualifying offer last year. They didn't have the front office in place. And instead, they decided to give him two years, which now you're on the books again, going into this massive shortstop class and he ultimately proved himself as not an everyday shortstop. He's one of the worst stop, shortstops in baseball last year. And I mean, to the point where they don't even like discuss him. He's like totally out of the picture and they're just like kind of paying him to sit on the bench. And so, I don't know if, if there was a team who was looking for cash and he said, you have to take Didi Gregorius. I'm, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it just seems very unlikely that Didi will be, sitting anywhere other than a Phillies uniform and coming off the bench next season, to be honest. You mentioned Bryson Stott. Um, what are your expectations for him? I kind of almost think that, you know, at this point, after Arizona Fall League uh, performance, that he might have a shot at this uh, roster right out of spring training. Yeah, no, that's – I mean, the way they talk about him is that if he's not the opening day shortstop, he will be very, very soon. I mean, you always, you always have to think about this. And, again, this is stuff – this is all up for debate in the CBA. But, I mean, let's say they keep the same rules in place here regarding service time and free agency. You know, some, you'll oftentimes see teams keep a guy down in the minors for three weeks to get that extra year of service time. So, 
but I, I would expect to see him on the roster at the absolute latest by the end of April, if they don't sign, you know, a shortstop or don't sign someone to fill that role. I mean, he seems like your best shortstop option in the organization as we sit here on, you know, in early December. So I, my expectations for him seems like definitely got a lot of potential to play the guy who's, you know, really made headlines in the Arizona fall league. He's played in things. I like the futures game out of the all-star game uh, profiles is, you know, a guy who gets it done defensively at shortstop, but a guy who can really, really hit. Of course, we've heard all about him ever since the Phillies drafted him. Vegas guy, obviously, uh, you know, him and Bryce Harper are good friends. Um, so I have high hopes and high expectations for him. And quite frankly, I think the Phillies do too. And I mean, they better because I don't know if they really have uh, any other options within the organization at this point to play shortstop. You're not going to go back to Didi. Gene Segura is not going to go back to shortstop. You don't we wouldn't have anyone at second base anyway. So as of right now, as, again, as far as I'm concerned, you know, Bryson Stott is the shortstop for the 2022 Phillies until further notice. There may be a lockout, but there's still stuff to talk about. Thank you, Dan Wilson from Locked On Phillies for joining us today. You can talk, breaking down everything that's going on with MLB and the Philadelphia Phillies. You can listen on the Lock On Phillies anywhere you get your podcasts. Thanks for joining us, Dan. Thank you so much for having me. Always fun talking Phils.